Hello and welcome to the Try Talking Sport podcast hosted by me, Joanne Murphy. Whether you are an athlete, adventurer, endurance enthusiast or simply have an interest in sport, you have come to the right place for inspiration, encouragement, motivation and as always plenty of entertainment. Well, how are you this week? I hope you had a lovely Easter break. I spent most of it on my bike racking up plenty of miles and working up a serious appetite for an excess of chocolate. And I can tell you there was plenty of chocolate enjoyed. From a big gravel adventure of 90k the week before Easter to a fabulous 100k spin on Freddy on Good Friday to our time trials with the Cycling Connacht women as part of the training for Modelo 24 on the bank holiday Monday there was lots of fun on two wheels enjoyed. So much so, I found it really hard to get back to reality and back to work after all of my fun outdoors. I'm still really enjoying my training routine with the cycling and swimming. I do need to get myself in gear for some more running though. And of course, I need to get back into the sea sooner than later. That's definitely on my to-do list over the next few days. Hopefully, the sunny weather will make it easier to get back in the sea. The triathlon racing season is quickly approaching. It won't be long until we are in the full swing of things. I'll be kicking off my triathlon announcing season at La Coutre Castle Triathlon on May 27th and 28th before heading to Triathai on the June Bank holiday weekend. And then it's off to Staffordshire for the first Ironman 70.3 in the UK this year. It's shaping up to be a super season and I'm excited to get it all started. Anyone planning on racing at La Coutre or indeed any of the Castle Race Series events this year, be sure to use the code TTS23CRS to avail of 25% off all of their races this season. The National Mixed Relay Championship, the National Sprint Aquathlon Championship and the first round of the Youth Series, supported by Cost Cutter, will all take place at La Coutre Castle this year. So it's going to be a very busy and hopefully a very sunny weekend of racing. So don't miss out. Get registered today. The clock is ticking. Speaking of discounts, Bear Events have given us 10% discount across two more of their races, including the Wheelworks Fast Lane Half Marathon and 10k in May, and the Park West Night Run 10k and 5k in July. If you use the code TTSBG2023, you'll get 10% on race entry for both of these events. There are lots of events listed on www.trytalkingsport.com, so you can check out these events and more on the site. If you are the organiser of an event and it is not listed on our website, be sure to get in touch with all the details and we'll get it listed for you. Emma also has a great roundup of lots of the sporting action and athlete success over on the website, so be sure to check this out whilst you are browsing all of the events. And as always, don't forget about our discount on Nuisan products. If you haven't checked them out yet, today is the day to do it. Go to www.nuisan.com to see their range of products and use the code TTS15 to get 15% discount on their range. Now to this week's episode with British triathlete Ben Goodfellow. Ben took up triathlon in 2017 and since then he has gone from strength to strength in the sport. In 2022, he had an incredible year of success, winning Ironman 70.3 Staffordshire outright. He was the overall age group winner at Ironman 70.3 Swansea before being crowned the men's 25 to 29 age group world champion at the Ironman 70.3 World Championship in Utah last October. Stepping up to full distance racing at Ironman UK in Bolton last year, he finished in fourth place on debut at the distance. This year, he moved from age group athlete into the professional ranks, aiming to debut as a pro athlete at the Ironman 70.3 Staffordshire this coming June. He will continue to work full time as an engineer for the foreseeable future, whilst he also pursues his passion for sport. Prior to racing across the Ironman events in the UK last year, Ben had racked up a series of super results in recent years, including in 2021, where he was crowned the British Standard Distance Duathlon Champion, the Helvellyn Triathlon winner and the Welsh Middle Distance Champion. His success coming on the back of his commitment and dedication to being the best athlete he can possibly be. Although he was sporty as a child, as he moved through his teens, he left sport behind in favour of time in the virtual world and in his own words became addicted to gaming. Enjoying and embracing his gaming a little too much, it was in his final year of university that he ditched the virtual world for reality and has risen steadily in the sport of triathlon. Coached by the wonderful Nathan Ford as part of Team NFT, Ben Starr continues to rise and I expect we will see a lot more success as he navigates through the world of professional sport. Watch this space. Now, go grab a cuppa and enjoy the show. Ben Goodfellow, welcome to the Try Talking Sport podcast. How are you? I'm, I'm really good, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. It's a great honour. 
Well, I'm delighted to have you on the show. We spent quite a bit of time together at races in 2022. Yeah, gosh, we started off with Stafford, 70.3. And then there was Bolton, Wales, the World Championship and Swansea. So yeah, yeah. quite a lot. Yeah, definitely get meeting you around the race circuits. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, I have to say now, um, I think my favourite memory of you is not only running down the finish line in um, in Stafford and breaking the tape, and also then obviously racing in Swansea and taking the age group win in Swansea, but actually I think my favourite moment is seeing you on stage in Utah as the age group world champion. But in Utah, you actually came up and said hello to me at the Parade of Nations, just kind of like came over and said, hey, Joe, how are you? And I just thought, what a lovely lad. To come hmm. over in the midst of all the chaoticness and just come over and say, hey, Joanne, how's it going? And I just thought, this guy is just, he's just fabulous. And so you had a great race. So I think I was your lucky charm. I'm taking yeah, all yes, the Yes, c- certainly. I, 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 I think all those races have been some of my best races. So yeah, definitely seems yeah. to be a, a lucky charm, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm taking that bragging rights anyway. Um, So Ben, before we get started, tell me what's the story with the whole Wilf thing? Because... Every time uh, somebody mentioned you, it was always, oh, that's Wilf, that's Wilf. And I'm like, what in God's name is his name? Because I'm like, it's Ben Goodfellow, and then everybody's calling him Wilf. So what is the story? Yeah, so I've had this my whole life. So from a young kid, my parents always went with the name Wilf, which is my second name. Full full name on like a birth certificate is Benjamin Wilfred Goodfellow. And I believe quite early on, uh, my grandparents were saying, oh, Ben's a bit of a common name. And they, they like the idea of a multi alternative name. So my parents just started calling me Wilf. And then all the way through my childhood, it was Wilf and everything, even through school. But I, I don't always get the teachers at the, at the first few days of uh, New Year saying, oh, he's a Ben. And I'd have to correct him to Wilf. And then when I started my job, there was more sort of formal documents to sign and the orders came back as Ben. So I sort of go by both now, make use of both of them. It makes for very interesting fun on the Ironman finish line when you go to call you across the line. But extra cheering for everyone. I guess it's support from <laughs> Will, Will, Ben. Yeah, just you're running around a corner and it's like, here comes Wilf, and you're like, who's Wilf? They're not coming up on the iPad. It's Ben. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, tell me a little bit, Ben, about yourself, where you're from, and uh, how you got into the sport of triathlon. Yeah, so I'm 26 years old now. I was born in Kendal in Cumbria, in the Lake District, North England. And that's where I grew up as well. Went to secondary school there, primary school, swimming club as a kid or in that area. And then when I moved to, well, I moved to North Wales, Wrexham for university and I've ended up staying there now. So obviously must love it there, do you, that you're still there? Yeah, yeah. So finished uni and got a job straight in the area. But for the sport, which I've ended up picking up through university, it's a really great area, really. You've got the, the hills of sort of North Wales and Snowdonia and stuff, which are really hilly for the bike. And then you've also got some flat grounds towards Cheshire and stuff. So it's a really great area for training. And tell me, um, what did you study in college? So I'm an engineer by trade and I studied engineering at university as well. That was specialised in automotive engineering, but I've gone into just general mechanical engineering now and I programme CNC machines, which cut metal for aerospace parts. So. so are you a maths nerd? Uh, I'm okay with a calculator, but mental math is not my strong suit. Yeah, I definitely rely on a calculator and a computer. Does the fact that you have an interest in numbers benefit your training and your interest in the statistics? I think it definitely does, yeah. I'm always a bit of a, a stat geek and yeah, lo- love to look over the training after I've done it. I think it does help, especially with analysing race results and working out where you can improve. I think it is a bit beneficial. How did you get into triathlon? I know you were a swimmer as a kid and you did some fell racing and stuff as well, but there was a patch there in the middle where there was more um, more virtual activity than there was real life activity, I believe. Yeah, so as you say, as a kid, I did a bit of club swimming. I was okay in club swimming, but I was never anything special, never made regional or national level or anything like that. Uh, my sister, well, I had two sisters. My older one was a really, really good runner. She used to compete for the county and went to nationals and stuff. And occasionally I'd get dragged along to the local running races. And as a kid, I was quite chubby and wasn't very athletic for running. And yeah, went to these races, but never did very well. And then by about 16, so early teens, secondary school, I'd just sort of given up on swimming. And as you say, did, moved into lots of gaming. Uh, that started off on the PlayStation and then eventually moved on to PCs and a bit more serious and continued that all the way through from 
middle of secondary school to final year of university, really, being a bit too good at gaming. For somebody who doesn't really understand the whole gaming thing, other than getting on my turbo and loving <laughs> Swift, I don't really understand it. So give me some insight into what it meant to be a gamer whilst you're trying to do your exams, whilst you're in college, trying to have a great college life and experience as well. Well, I think with gaming, it's it's got some similarities to sport in the sense where they deliberately make the games... So you're always making like progression and unlocking stuff and working towards new achievements. So they're very good at uh, latching onto sort of the addictive nature of someone like me. Like most athletes have generally got an addictive nature. And I think, yeah, the the games are very good at hooking you in, always giving you the sense of progression, which keeps you stuck in them. How did you balance your studies and the gaming? Like what sort of percentage of time did you spend in college versus sitting up playing your PlayStation and your computers late at night into the early mornings. Yeah, there was, there was definitely lots of late at nights into early mornings that spent gaming. But uh, yeah, I think, I think I got that balance about right with uni work and stuff. I managed to come away over first. So I must see you must be awful okay. brainy though. Are you awful brainy? Uh, no, not really. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm quite dyslexic, so... There's certain things I'm good at, which leads to sort of maths and physics and stuff I'm generally quite good at. But anything that's language-based or uh, like short-term memory-based, I'm not very good at that sort of stuff. So it's swings and roundabouts, yeah. Okay, so I can kind of understand how the gaming would be somewhere that you'd be very comfortable in as well, because it's all numbers as well, I imagine. And you're trying to hit targets and things like that. Or maybe I'm completely off the mark, am I? Yeah, yeah. I think mean, that's very much correct. And I think, I think generally speaking, people that are dyslexic are better at visualizing visualizing stuff in their brain and w- working through games and stuff like that and 3D spaces, sort of where, where they're very good at visualizing. How did you get yourself out of the gaming um, activities? Like, how did you end up moving away from it to turn that personality trait of addiction maybe into um, triathlon and sport? Uh, it, was a, it was quite a quick transition, really. In the final year of uni... I decided I wanted to get back into swimming because I realised I wasn't doing enough physical activity, basically. So I joined the local tri club because that, that was the easiest way to access a swimming pool. And then eventually somebody sort of convinced me to come along to the running track on the Wednesday evening. And then did a few group rides as well. And just it, it went from not really doing much sport at all to swim, bike, run very quickly, really. When you look back at what you were doing as a kid with the swimming and maybe the running with your sister, like, do you do you look back now and kind of go, gosh, maybe there was a talent there that if it had been harnessed, I might have come to sport earlier in life? Um, I think my body's naturally been quite a slow developer. I'm still quite a small build and stuff. And I think the way childhood sport works, and you get it with the big like football teams and NFL and stuff like that, the kids that develop quickly seem to have a lot more natural talent because they're just naturally more muscly. Whereas I think lots of them do end up burning out and stuff because they go through academies and get pushed really hard. So I think maybe if I'd been better as a kid, I wouldn't enjoy it so much now. Whereas I've sort of gone through the aspect of not being that good at sport. And now that I've come back to it in later life, found that I'm doing okay at it. So that sort of seeing progression and knowing where I've come from is really the motivator to keep going. And do you think because you've gone back to sport as a choice, rather than, as you mentioned earlier, you were dragged along by your sister to the fell races, that there's kind of like a different approach to sport in your life now and that that maybe is helping to make a difference as well? Plus the yeah, fact de- that you're really fast and strong, obviously, <laughs> and you're good at it. Yeah, de- definitely. If, 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 if anyone had told me as a kid that I, most weeks of the day I'd vo- voluntarily be getting up at 5.20 to get to the pool for six o'clock, I never would have believed it. I, I don't know. I don't know where the motivation comes from now, but I definitely wouldn't have ever had that as a kid. So it it is a complete 180 on my mindset towards sport, basically. Yeah. And and I'm sure that there were nights when you were still playing your PlayStation at 5.20 in the morning and the furthest thing was going to bed or in fact getting up out of it if you were in it. Certainly. Yeah, it's a big change, isn't it? Yeah, certainly. I, I, I think like my family and stuff are really happy that I've gone through it. So it's a lot, a lot more healthy to be addicted to sport than uh, gaming and stuff. So being physically active over sat on a couch. So yeah. 
Exactly. Now you've, you've done quite a lot. I think I only met you for the first time last year, wasn't it? The first set of Ironman races la- was last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so you've had quite a big impact before you came to Ironman. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about some of the racing that you had done before you stepped to the Ironman middle distance and long distance racing, because you have done quite a few races. Um, you were doing duathlon, your world, was it world champion or European champion at duathlon level as well? Uh, yeah, that was last year as well. But yeah, that, yeah. So l- l- last year was sort of, well, it, it's bad for me to say, but I think it was quite a breakout year for me in terms of results. Uh, but then they have steadily been building year on year. I sort of stepped into the sport in 2017, so seven years ago now. Minus that, two for COVID. Yeah, uh, was that sorry? Yeah, minus two for COVID. But I, I still got in quite a few races around the COVID time. Yeah. The way I first got into it is I, after I just joined that tri club, and I quite early entered a 70.3 in Lancashire called Epic Man, which is one of the ones that Epic Events runs. And that was in July time of 2017. And that was the first thing I was working towards. Uh, completed that. That was my one event for the year. Uh, did okay in that, but I uh, was really hooked onto it. And the year after that, my biggest goal was probably Hell Velen, which is a race I went on to do quite a few times. I did that in 2018, 2019, and 2020, I think. So three years on the bounce. In fact, no, it was four years on a bounce. And that, that that was a really good race for judging my progress because in the first year, I ended up finishing third. And then the second year, I came second. And then the year after that was the first COVID year, 2020. And it was the year they had like, because there was no racing for, for most of the world, the PTO organized that as a prize uh, race. So you had everyone from like Alistair, all, all the UK pros turned up basically. You had Al- Alistair Brownie, Joe Skipper, uh, yeah, lots of them guys turned up. So I ended up winning the age group part of that race, but not the overall because there was a pro wave for the first ever time. And then came back the year after that and eventually won it overall. So yeah, that, 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 that's been a big race for judging my progression. And what was it like standing on the start line with the pros that you probably had been looking up to since you had taken up the sport? Yeah, definitely. Al- Al- Alistair Brownlee... Before I was probably into sport, obviously, because I started in 2017. But we did go to Hyde Park in 2012 to watch the Olympics, me and my family. And, yeah, being in Hyde Park, watching him do what he did, watching Johnny come back from the penalty, that was highly motivating. And, yeah, he's definitely sort of seen as an idol for me. He's So you would have been well aware of, say, the Brownleys and, and some of the, the top-end elite British um, athletes before you ever kind of got into the sport yourself? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to name any long distance racers, but I definitely could have named the Brownleys and okay. some of the, the ITE people from the Olympics, basically, yeah. Yeah, and interestingly, how did you go from, say, your gaming life to your try life to make that switch up to triathlon to do that very first race? Or what was the catalyst that you picked that very first race in 2017? Uh, I've always liked the idea of challenging and I think for anyone the, the Ironman distance is definitely a challenge and a massive achievement it's one of those things I, I don't know the stats and how what percentage of people have completed an Ironman but I can't imagine over the world's population it's got to be far less than one percent so it's a good thing to be able to say you've got a bit of a conversation starter so that, that, that was my early goal starting out was completing Ironman and I saw the first way of doing that is that epic man the the first one I did in 2017 the middle distance did you do many sprint races and Olympic races? Uh, I've done some on the on the route through, just as like training races and stuff. But I've never not coming from a ITU speed background. I don't think I'm ever sort of really built for that sort of uh, the speedy side of it. I'm definitely more endurance based. And how did you go about building up your? base of fitness to be able to compete now at the highest level as a pro and having gone from a very low base I imagine of fitness to now being where you are at today Uh, I think it's just I've been quite lucky with injury minus two self-inflicted bone breaks I've been able to get through very much without any wear and tear sort of injuries so it's just been built on top of consistency really like Mm -hmm. at the moment I'm probably doing like 20 plus hour weeks but I'm, not, I'm sure I haven't looked back at the training peaks, but back when I was starting, it's got to be way, way, way less than that, if not less than five. But yeah, just slowly building up year on year. 
and consistency. I haven't, I haven't really had any big layoffs for injury. So you did have a collarbone injury and you had a toe injury, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, collarbone was the COVID year. I spent loads, loads of time on the turbo during the COVID year. And then finally, as the UK sort of opened up, the weather was really good. I decided to get back out on the bike. Took my hand off the handlebars on a windy day. Jackknife the front end of the bike, threw me over the front and broke my collarbone. Ouch. Uh, and then the broken foot was only 10 weeks ago now. So that's quite a recent one. Just running on a cycle path and sort of stumbled. Thought I'd just rolled my ankle to start with, but it turns out all the force had gone through the outside edge of my foot and it's broken what they call the fifth metatarsal. But I'm on, I think I'm pretty much healed now. I had an x-ray four weeks ago, the six-week x-ray. And there were signs of growth, and now there's no pain from it at all. So I think I'm safe to in start training again. In the clear, maybe? I think so, yeah. Yeah. So talk to me then about, say, your season last year, because this is when we first met. So you did your very first Ironman 70.3 race in Staffordshire. There was an age group race, and you broke the tape. I know it wasn't your first middle distance race, but it was your first Ironman race. Was there a difference stepping up from, say, a local middle distance race versus an Ironman one? Yeah, very, very much so. That that Staffordshire race, turning up on the day before to wrap your bike and stuff, split transitions there and the amount of people going in, getting your numbers printed and stuff, there was definitely a lot of pressure. It, it felt like a big event, like half of Stafford Town's like directing to parking and stuff. And yeah, it definitely felt a big step up going up to the Ironman branded events. And yeah. what sort of um, expectations did you have going into that race? I mean, did you expect to win it? Uh, no, I didn't expect to win it. The year before, they'd run a, a, a version of the Bolton course of 70.3. And I was looking at some of the times versus the 70.3 I'd done that year. And it seemed like I could probably be within the top 10, maybe top five. Uh, but it's always tough to judge on different courses and different days and different weather conditions and who's going to turn up on the day. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, I was expecting to be somewhere around the top 10, top five, but... To, to be right up there at the very top was a real surprise and yeah obviously great and going into Stafford had you already booked in for Bolton and for Swansea at that point or were they decisions made after you saw your performance in Stafford uh so it, I was booked in for Bolton and Wales not Swansea at that point the Wales slot was actually rolled over from the first Covid year so there, there was two years uh, yeah, I'd, I'd originally planned to do the, the Ironman Wales in 2020, and then it was cancelled two years in a row. And in 2021, Bolton had gone ahead, but Wales hadn't. So I kind of thought at the end of that year, stuff that I'm going to enter both, and surely one will go ahead, and then they both end up going ahead. So yeah, I went from no, no, no Ironman to two in the first year. And how did you do in Bolton? Uh, Bolton was really a uh, mixed race for me, but in the end, I'm still proud of it. So, as you say, it was my first full distance, and it was uh, an interesting one. I came out of the water in third place, which for me is pretty good, because generally a swim is quite weak for me. And within about 10, 20 miles on the bike, I managed to go into first place, and felt really strong, and kept getting splits from random people on the streets. So it, was, it was a really good course, that is three laps of a hilly course. And there's people cheering everywhere. And they're always giving me updates on how I was getting on. And I think by about the half distance on the bike, I had something crazy, like a 12-minute lead over second place. And then something went wrong with the fuel and the wheels came off the wagon. I ended up going from a 12-minute lead to sort of 12 minutes off the lead in fourth place by the end of the bike. In fact, it was even, I think it was about sixth place by the end. Started the run and just made sure to keep getting energy gels and water from the feed stations. I managed to build back up from about sixth to fourth over the line overall and second in age group. So for, for a first Ironman, it was definitely some, well, hopefully lessons learned uh, on pacing because I'm going to gone out a bit too hard on the bike and suffered a bit towards the middle of the race. But I was really proud of being able to come back to get stronger on the marathon. It was uh, four laps of the marathon course there. And looking back on it, every single lap, I got faster and faster. So I negative split the marathon each lap, which I think is pretty rare for an Ironman and not by design. Yeah, from what I remember, the the pointy end of the business on the day was very exciting between George Martindale 
who was the eventual winner. George and, won it. Jack first? Schofield second. And, and wasn't um, Dan McParland there somewhere as well, was he? Yeah, Dan was third. Then it was me. Then it was Dan Elliott. And then oh, I can't remember sixth place name now. But yeah, it was it, it, was, it was a good race between us. All. At, at various points, we were all moving up and down around those six. Yeah, so it was very exciting for for me as the announcer to be watching it and to be commentating on it live for the um, for the spectators. It was very exciting and it was very. It was I think it was quite nail biting in the end to see would um, George actually hang on at the front. And of course, we had Dave Riley who was our final finisher, and he finished in um, sixteen fifty nine fifty six. He had like literally four seconds to spare crossing the line. Like it was such an epic day of racing right through to when. Dave crossed later that night it was amazing yeah and the, and the center of Bolton really is is got a really good atmosphere to it as well mm-hmm. there's those people most of the way around the run course I suppose yeah, having four yeah. having four loops Ben uh, better than an out and back uh, I would say so yeah I think it's it's definitely I, don't know, it's just, I guess in some ways it's easier mentally in some ways it's harder mentally because you, you know what you've got coming but then you also if, if you're suffering after one lap you've got three more of them to go whereas sometimes it's better not knowing but I think I generally prefer having shorter laps on the run. I guess you get to tick them off as you go then as well. So there's that psychological thing. Yeah, and you're more likely to have support around more of the course as well. Mm. And then um, you did Swansea. So you mentioned that you didn't have Swansea in the books before uh, you signed up for, for Bolton. Um, and no, so Sw- Sw- Swansea was quite a late entrance. I think I uh, entered that about three or four weeks before the actual race. And that was basically just based on... It had a pro wave there and it seemed like everyone, most of the UK athletes from pros to age groupers were all going down there. And it's also, I'm, I'm coached by Nathan Ford and part of Nathan Ford Triathlon and they're based down in that sort of Swansea area. So I knew the support was going to be really good and it'd be really good to see some of the athletes in, in person and stuff. So it just sort of made sense to go down there and see it. Yeah, it was a, it was a big, uh, it was a deep pro field uh, on the day. Of course, Alistair Brownlee taking the tape as the pro winner, but you were the fastest overall age grouper on the day. That was two from two, 70.3s. Yeah, yeah, another sort of surprise. And it was really good to be able to see how I'd stack up against the pros. Uh, I think comparing my time to them, I think the prize money went down like eight places. And I think I had a time that was equivalent to about 10th, but it, it wasn't a million miles away from the lower echelons of the... Mm-hmm. The prize money which w- would have been a, a very big surprise and obviously race dynamics and stuff play out completely differently between the pros so yeah would have been interesting and I think at that point Ben you had mentioned that you were thinking about going pro for 2023 but you had to finish within a certain percentage time of the winner or something was that how it was working yeah so the the, the British triathlon have quite a it makes sense when you put it down on paper but it's quite hard for them to explain where basically different prize money amounts that the event is worth then means you've got to be within a certain percentage of the winner's time. So it's like a sliding scale varying depending on how much the prize money is. So they, if the prize money is higher, they, they predict a better quality of pro will turn up. So then you've got to be, with, you can have a bit of a bigger margin in time. And then obviously if, if it's less prize money, they predict less competitive people will turn up. So you can be, you have to be close to their time. Mm-hmm. There's a bit of a sliding scale. So it, it's, it's hard one to know going into the race, what you've got to do. But you've got to race as hard as you can and see how close you can get. How did you stack up against Alistair Brownlee? I think I needed 8% and I ended up with like 8.9. So it was close percentage-wise, but yeah, it wasn't quite enough on that day. And so then on to Wales. And I don't remember you crossing the finish line in Wales. No, Wales was a a bit of a tough race for me. And yeah, the uh, weather conditions on the swim were really rough. I don't think I fared well. In the water, I remember swallowing quite a lot of water during the swim. Uh, came out of the water, I'm not sure where I was position wise, but knew I had ground to make up. Uh, set out on the bike and was feeling okay. Worked way through some of the pros that had set off a bit ahead, but there were still some age groupers up the road. And just before the end of the bike, I managed to catch up with the person that was leading age grouper and pass him to take the lead coming out into T2. And when I just started running, my stomach just felt horrendous and tried to take on gels and water, but I just felt bad. I made a few the portally stops. I finished one lap running still. Starting the second lap, it's quite like a slow climb on the Wales course. Or it's a gradual climb, but very long. 
and just kept getting slower and slower. People that were like unlapping me and stuff, and then I, I just got to stage where I was walking. I've never really been like that before, and just yeah, completely capitulated. Really, I ended up by the side of the road, sat down, just completely drained. And yeah, so still to the day, don't really know why it went so bad so quickly. But as I say, coming off the bike, I didn't feel that bad, and I got to the front of the race, and then within twenty, well, less than twenty k of the run, I was. Stopped by the side of the road, shaking, pale. I don't know. Wow. And you didn't figure out whether it was a nutrition issue or whether you caught a virus or whether you were unwell or something, or it was just one of those days? Uh, no, I've never really pinned it down. I'm never very good in the cold. And most of that day was okay, but there were a few rain showers on the run. Uh, historically, when, I, when I'm low on energy and bonking, I do get quite cold. So I think it was just bad timing of getting really cold, running out of energy and just, you know, my body sort of shut down and decided I didn't want to go any further. Was it tough, Ben? Like, was it tough to deal with that? Having having done so well in Stafford and Swansea and, you know, you had the middle distance to Atlan World and European champion title behind you and then suddenly it's like, boom, you are not moving anywhere, buddy. You are stopping right now and sitting down. Yeah, it was just it was just a complete shocker to me. I like, never have anything like that before. And, I felt low on energy before, but I've, ne- I've never been to a stage where I can't run, let alone I could barely walk by the end of it. I was just completely zonked. Uh, yeah, not 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 my proudest moment. And I really sort of wish now that I'd just sat by the side of the road for a bit longer. I, I, I don't know if I would have been able to find like a foil blanket or something from anywhere and taken half an hour and then still made the finish line. Because I ended up coming back for the end of the day to see the last finishes in. And yeah, it definitely made me feel more guilty seeing the extreme lengths that some of them are going to to get across the line versus by that point I'd had food and warmed up and I felt, yeah, like I'd I'd just pulled the plug too early. But at the time, it didn't feel like it was too early. So, yeah, it's it's a tough one. Well, you've got to remember as well, I guess, that like it's it's a race. uh, You weren't feeling well. There's going to be more races. Yes, it's disappointing, but you also had worlds coming up as well. So you've got to remember to protect your your body and the machine that's going to get you to the start line of your next race. So sometimes you do have to pull the plug and just let it be what it is. Yeah, Nathan was out on course, my coach, and he he, he did mention don't go too deep. If, if if it's not going to happen today, then world is only, is it four to six weeks away? I think it was. It, it was relatively close. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's one of those things. I, I still wish I'd made it to the finish line, but given how St. George went in the end, I think I'd probably still trade... No, I wouldn't trade the St. George result for crossing that finish line. Yeah. Wales will always be there, but uh, the World Championships is much harder to uh, to qualify for. So, um, yeah. you know, so hopefully the next time there's a, a pro race at uh, yeah, Wales. I'm very much hoping this year's not got one. It's the female pro and they tend to alternate. So 2024, hopefully, fingers crossed, I can go Maybe. back there and get, get some redemption. Yeah. And as a pro as well, rather than an age grouper. Um, So let's talk a little bit about Utah. Uh, You're the men's 25 to 29 Ironman 70.3 world champion. What was it like standing on the stage with your trophy on the top step of the podium? Oh, it's a very, very special moment. In fact, where I'm sat now, I can see it on the mantle up there. Uh, Yeah, it's a, it's a big old trophy. So getting it home in the bike box was a bit of a Hard one to do. I, I did end up getting stung with an overcharged weight by the end of it because of all the stuff. Worth it though. But yeah, de- de- definitely worth it. And as you say, it was a very special moment. The, the whole trip out to America was amazing. Like I was first time out to the Ed the States and the weather wasn't quite what I was expecting when I signed up. Because I'd seen it, they had the full distance champs in May. And I don't know what temperatures they had, but they were definitely a lot warmer than we had. Sweltering heat. Yeah, when we were there in sort of uh, October, September, October, yeah, October, in the mornings it was really cold. I think even some of the mornings you had to de icy cars and stuff. Uh, and the swim start was pretty cold, but I think it was even colder for the women the day before. By the end of the days, it was getting mid teens to 20. So it was a big swing of temperature through the days, but really interesting time being out in America. I'd, I'd definitely go out there again and race some of the more of the American courses. It seemed really good fun. Yeah, it was a great course. Tough, honest course, I think. Yeah, very very tough. Very, yeah, I'd say so. The bike was actually more hilly than I was expecting. It made a big deal of Snow Canyon, but I would say more of the climbing was in the first half of the bike course than that Snow Canyon section. It was surprisingly rolling and hilly before then. 
And then the run was through a golf course, which was a bit undulating as well. But I'm given to believe the previous 70.3 St. George course uh, that they've used in the past was like way more hilly than that again on, on this road that goes over the side of the mountain. And for me, I think I would have enjoyed that even more. But yeah. I get the feeling that you like hilly courses. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite a lightweight build now. So I'm 5'9", I'm so one seven five in centimetres. And race weight's about 62 kilograms. So I think that works out about 10 stone. So I'm, I'm quite a lightweight build relative to most triathletes. I would say most of the pros sit around the 70 to 80 kilogram mark. So I'm, I'm quite a bit lighter than most people I'm racing in generally. So the hillier the course, the better normally. Swings and roundabouts really though, because if we look at Wales and you're getting really cold. Um, yes. So it can, maybe some of the warmer races might suit you better. Yeah, I haven't raced that much in the heat. I can only point back to, I went and did Alpe de Huez triathlon, which is a, a really great race. I'd love to do that again. That would have been 2019. And that was ridiculously hot. I think that was the bottom of the valley. because That's at like l- low elevation. It was about 40 degrees. And by the time you got up to Alpe de Huez at 2K elevation, it was about 30. But yeah, that was a brutal race. And for me, I, I think temperature is quite a good thing. I generally do my better performances in the heat if i'm not mistaken i think staffordshire was a lovely day and swansea was toasty warm yeah both of those two i think they were quite warm days but i wouldn't have ever said i was hot on those days i think that's perfect temperature for me i I think mid-20s or 20-ish is around perfect for me whereas i think most people probably prefer teens yeah the pro situation talk to me about this now so you've been racing since 2017 you've made lots of big marks and lots of big results um right up the whole way up to last year why now to go pro why not give it another year um it's an interesting one I'm I'm 26 now going 27 in May so I'm definitely wouldn't say I'm old but there are definitely youngsters coming through that are far younger than me and have come from a speedy background of ITU and sprint standards uh so I kind of see that my peak years in the sport will be between now and maybe give myself another six years of where I'll see my, my prime from, from now till 20, uh, 34, probably the peaks of what, what I can do in the sport. So I thought I'd jump on it now that I've qualified. I, I couldn't have done it before this year because it had took that World Championships result to qualify, but now I've qualified. Give a go of it. I'm not sure what level I can really compete at, but for this first year, if I can make the prize money once, That'd be a nice sort of achievement because I'm also working full time still. So it's the, the way I see it. I've qualified for a professional slash elite license and I'm very much racing elite now as opposed to professional who to me is somebody that makes the living out of the sport. So what, what changes now, Ben, that you're pro or slash elite as an athlete rather than an age grouper? Uh, basically, for most of the age group racing, they sort of stagger the wave starts. So you never truly know who you're racing, whereas for the the pro the pro starts it's always a sort of mass start on the line so everyone sets off in the water at the same time so you always know where you are in the race and then there is also that added bonus of the pros can compete for prize money whereas the age group you get trophies but there's no money on the line so yeah and 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 it's also just that thing of it's you can always as an age grouper compare your time to the pros but it's not quite the same as having the exact same conditions and the same race dynamics so, and if we look at the season ahead for 2023, what races are you targeting and what race will be your first pro race? Uh, first pro race will be Stafford again, which I'm r- really happy for. Uh, that's a, obviously 70.3. They're doing a pro race this year. They didn't have one last year. And it's a, bit, it's a bit odd with the race planning that they've got Stafford 70.3. I think it works out as the 12th of June. And the exact same day, they've also got Challenge Wales, which is also another 70.3. That's also got pros. So there's going to be quite a split of the pro field in the UK, which would be good and bad, I guess. It'd be interesting to see who turns up to which one. Uh, I have raced that Challenge Wales course in the past, and I really like that. That's another. Both courses are very hilly, so they both suit me. It's a shame that they do overlap, because I would like to have done both. Uh, But yeah, having a chance to race, I'm I'm going to go with Stafford because it's a bit more close to me. And yeah, I know the course well, so it'd be interesting to see how I get on there. After Stafford, I'm thinking about heading over to France to do the Nice full distance Ironman, which will be interesting because it's quite a hilly course, I'm given to believe, on the bike. 
The weather should be warm, so that should suit me. And it's also going to be the World Champs course for the men later in the year. So it'd be good to be able to see the course. And then when I'm watching the pros on TV, I can be able to reflect on the pain they're going through and have an understanding of where they're going and stuff. So I think that's always a bit more interesting. And are there aspirations to race in Nice, potentially in, what would it be, 2025? Uh, well, I, I think from, from where I am now, that's a very much a stretch goal. Um, obviously, if, if, if I ever did qualify, that'd be amazing. But to qualify for the World Champs as a pro, you've basically got to win uh, one of the pro races for Ironman. So if you take a race like Wales, it would only have been Skipper that got a place for his win at Wales. So it's very, very hard to get a pro slot for the world champs. But if, if it happens, I'd obviously take it with open arms and it'd be an amazing, it'd be well over what I thought I could achieve in the sport. But yeah. Really? Would you think so? Yeah, I certainly think so. I don't know. I, 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 I think I've done very well with the abilities I've got, but I think I'm not naturally talented with speed. And I don't know, it's hard to say because I've, I've achieved a lot more than I thought I could ever achieve. But I still don't see myself as naturally gifted at sport. I only see myself as naturally gifted at being addicted to something. And what I'm addicted to is training, which has led me to be quite good at sport. But I don't think I've got that extra level that's the, 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 the top echelons I've got. But it'd be interesting to see where I can get to. As I say, I've only been in the sport uh, seven years. So there's, there's still growth, I think. Yeah, I think you're being um, quite humble there, actually. I think there's a lot of potential that is still yet to be found. Oh, well, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. Um, talk to me about Nathan Ford and your relationship with Nathan. Oh, he's been on the podcast. Absolutely incredible human. You have a great relationship with Nathan as your coach. So first time I met Nathan, we were actually racing each other. and I, I didn't know anything about him at the time. Uh, it, it went down to this that Challenge Wales course we are talking about in 2020. It's a COVID year. And that's sort of his home turf. Uh, I was racing on the course. I ended up winning that. He came second and another Nathan Ford athlete came third. I did, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. No, yeah. So that, that was the first time I met him. We talked a bit after the racing stuff, but at the time I didn't know much about him, to be honest. Uh, and then the same year? No, it was 2021. The British Middle Distance Champs were over in Aberfeldy up in Scotland. It was a bit of a, a rubbish day. There was like rain showers on and off and all sorts. And he was going, obviously, he's a really good athlete. If he's coming second at the, the Welsh Champs, he's, he's a phenomenal athlete. And didn't he uh, win? Wasn't he overall winner at um, age group winner in Wales one year as well? Yes, he was as well. I think that was the year before, it would have been 2019, 19. I think. Yeah, because yeah. it would have been one of the years where they didn't have the male pros. So, yeah, he was the overall winner at Wales. So he's obviously got massive pedigree. And just at this race, he, he's still not sure to the day what actually happened. But he was on the bike and suddenly he was on the ground in a ditch. Oh, he, he didn't know he was, but he's, uh, he's gone through a horrific incident. Uh, from all the doctors and stuff at the time thought it was really, really bad. And obviously it has been really bad for him. Uh, but now he's he's back coaching. He's not able to compete anymore, but I think he he gets a lot of motivation and stuff. And he motivates everyone else, that's for sure, with his coaching. And yeah, I'm really proud to be able to represent him. Yeah, super guy. And uh, we often see on his Instagram uh, profile, the fight goes on and he definitely was uh, fighting for his life um, in that uh, that championships. In terms of the coach and athlete relationship, uh, Ben, it's really important that there is a lot of trust there, isn't there? Yeah, for sure. As you say, he's been to he's been to Kona World Champs before. He's, he's won Wales. So he's definitely someone that knows what he's talking about. I have full trust in his ability to coach and he's he's the right person, I think. Yeah, definitely. And do you get on well with him? Like, or, or what sort of relationship do you have? You know, where you a cheeky chappy kind of saying, oh, I, I, I want to just train, 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 train. And he's saying, ah, uh-uh, Ben, now step it back a little bit. No yeah, I, I, I think that's very much the case. I, I'm always, <laughs> the, the, the times when I've been without a coach, I've been very much overtraining, I think. Uh, it's, it's, the coach is very useful for me for sort of pulling back a bit. Uh, and But there's, there's also other aspects of having a coach looking over your training is also very good for those harder interval sessions or the stage you don't want to do it it's always good to have that always know that somebody watching over and it does give you that extra motivation somehow I don't think you need the accountability though 
to go training maybe you need the accountability to not go training but yeah some, 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 sometimes definitely yeah this it, it works both ways what does um a typical training week look like for you now we're building up to Ironman 70.3 Staffordshire in June which is not too far away it's probably two months away I'd say at this point it probably will be about two months bang on. I think it's the 12th so it's the 13th today so yeah we will be pretty much bang on two months yeah, so as I say, I'm still working a full-time job. And that's uh, Monday, Friday, and I start work at 8 and finish at 4.30. And then I'm pretty lucky that on a Friday, you get a half day, so we finish at 1.30. So 37 and a half hours of my week is spent in work. And training around that generally consists of, most mornings, I'll get up at 5.20. Uh, and the, the, the pool local to me, which I'm lucky to have it really local to me, it's literally a two-minute walk opens at six so I'll get up make a coffee and then throw the tennis ball for my dog in a little field across the road from me whilst drinking the coffee warming up a bit and then straight into the pool get about an hour in the pool in head to work for eight and then when I come in from work I'll generally get about two hours of training in in the evenings Uh, and that's what gets me through the middle of the week so an hour in the morning swimming and then the afternoons or the evenings a swim or a run and that Friday and the Saturday and the Sunday, I just make most of the time off work to get as much training done as I can. So big volume during the weekend. Yeah. And will you continue that now for as long as you can until it comes to the point where maybe you might make the decision to go into the sport full time? So you're you're a full time employee and a part time professional athlete, really. So yeah, will that, that, there become that's... a time you hope where it'll turn the other way, we've become a, a full time professional athlete as your job. Yeah, that's it's definitely the dream to transition that way. It's finding a good way to do that because with my role and work at the moment, I'm not sure how accommodating they would be to that. So I think it would take a full shift either to change jobs to somewhere that would allow me part time or go into something like coaching or a side side job that's not engineering for a while whilst I try and make that transition. Uh, this first year, I'm definitely just going to keep with my job because to date I've not made a penny from triathlon. Uh, so it'd be a big, a big commitment to make changes based on that. But yeah, let's we'll see how we get on this first year. And the dream's definitely to try and make transitions, but I need, I need to get results and sponsorship and stuff like that in place before I could start thinking about reducing work hours, really. And you mentioned coaching there. Is that something that you think you potentially will go down the road of in the future? Uh, I think it's the way that most professional athletes do make a, a fixed income. Uh, I think it's something I could be quite good at, but it's not something I've got much experience with currently. I have done a bit of kids coaching, swimming and go ride, which is a cycle of British cycling. I've done both of them in the past. I've got level ones in swimming and uh, cycle coaching, but I've never done it with adults. So, yeah, it would be an interesting one. And Ben, tell me what excites you about the sport of triathlon? Uh, the thing that's kept me into the sport to up to the point I started getting results was definitely just seeing consistent progress and just like every time you go to a track or you're on a, a bike ride or something and you're out getting a segment or just trying your hardest seeing progression is what sort of really drives me uh yeah so seeing progression and feeling like I'm getting stronger and faster and fitter uh, but there's also part of me that just loves getting out in nature and so some of my most enjoyable training sessions are when I just head out into the hills with the dog in the snow or just yeah on a nice sunny day go out exploring or on the bikes the same so there's there's a, there's a lot that pulls me to the spot there's the competitive aspect and trying to get results there's keeping fit and active and then being able to explore I think it yeah so it's a good balance really are you still a member of Wrexham Tri Club uh, I am still a member yeah I've, I've over time I've done less and less training with the group uh, just because of commitments around work and stuff and finding sl- slots that fit me well uh, I would like to start going back to the running track with them. I think it helps like, doing the speed work with other people on a running track. Uh, but yeah, I haven't been doing so much training with them recently, but I'm still around the area. Yeah, definitely. When you are training as much as you're training and working as many hours as you're working and, and your weekends are pretty full on with training, what do you do to just like chill out and relax other than go throwing the ball at Percy <laughs> when you're having a coffee at half five in the morning? And Percy is the dog, by the way. Yes, Percy is the dog, a little springer spaniel. Uh, about five years old now doesn't it well he likes exploring running when it's out in the hills and stuff but he doesn't like exploring when it's just a fast interval run or something like that he's, he's very much just a, a plodder most evenings i'll still spend half an hour to an hour sat on the sofa watching tv 
Uh, I have got a good group of friends who so, some of the, the biking I do is a, a social group of people that are all sort of my age and all cyclists. So it's it's good to socialize with them. Um, but mostly, yeah, just there it is a very much a a massive addiction of mine training. So most of my time is spent training, as I say, and I don't really mind that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, funny. I'm um, just thinking now back to your college days. So the you have friends of yours now that you go cycling and training with, and obviously buddies that you've met through triathlon. But the people who you were in college with, who knew you were big into gaming, are you still in contact with some of those guys? And what do they think now of this new Ben Goodfellow versus the Ben Goodfellow that was um, gaming? Yeah, I am still in contact with quite a few of them, but it's definitely harder because most of them are still on the computer games most evenings talking on what they call discord which is like a, a software that used to communicate with each other whereas because i'm not in that circle so much now i'm only part of like the facebook groups and stuff and seeing messages i don't really go on the discord and talk to them that often voice to voice so that's a bit different but i think it's, it's more surprising for the people that i see it's uh, the people that i saw on facebook from secondary school and stuff from when i was quite a chubby little kid and then i think it's quite a a big step forward to where I am now with sport. So I think that's always quite a surprising one. Yeah. And if I was to ask you, what is the thing you're most proud of? What would that be? Um, Probably just the way I've got into sport and man- to, to go from someone that just had a, a name of completing a set distance, which was the Ironman, to then seven years later be competing to quite a high level. I think that's what I'm most proud of is... It's something I never thought I'd be able to do to be competitive in sport and to find myself being able to do that is just a, a shock to me and those around me, I think. I think there's a huge message in that, what you're saying there. We spoke briefly earlier about your swimming and, and the fell running and um, self-admitted that you weren't very good at it. Yeah. <laughs> and I lost interest in it. And here you are now at 26 years of age, pursuing a career and a huge potential opportunity in sport. And you think of all the kids that were your age back when you were swimming and running who maybe got um, disengaged or maybe a bit disillusioned and left sport. Um, It's quite an interesting journey that you've been on and quite an inspirational one as well, Ben. I I don't want to throw that word around quite lightly, but I imagine that there's many listeners who are listening to the podcast who maybe themselves weren't good at sport as kids or maybe didn't go the full hog in terms of of where their potential would have led them. And now they're doing quite well as age groupers in triathlon. Yes. Or there's parents of kids who can see that their child isn't isn't able for ball sports or maybe doesn't have the coordination for hockey or basketball or hurling or football, whatever it is. Maybe they're a good runner or a good gymnast, but they're not they're not at the level that's required to be an elite athlete. That interest isn't there. And so um, I suppose what I wanted to ask you was if we have people who are listening who have kids maybe that were in a similar situation to yourself as a kid, um, what advice would you give to those parents about nurturing the talents and the ability of their children to find their way within sport or maybe to step away from it so they can choose to come back to it? You're, you're quite an example to other young people and an example for parents to look at so that their kids can can follow maybe in your footsteps potentially in, in certain directions. Yeah, so I, maybe I not think, the addiction to the gaming, but <laughs> no, no, yeah. I think with kids and and, and even, even the level of coaching I've done with kids, I think the most important thing is just to try and keep it fun and engaging for kids, because the, the 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 way we are as kids, anytime you have a bad experience, that will stick with you forever. So if you're getting pushed into an event or you finish an event, and you don't think you've done very well, then that, that's always going to be a negative around sport, and then you, you just you don't want to build any bridges that connect your brain to sport being bad so if, if you've got kids that are performing on doing racing and stuff and not performing well or anything like that you just got to try and make it find the positives in everything that they're doing not pressure them to try and get results or to train a certain amount or anything let them so say you want them to do one sport but they're, 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 they're juggling lots of sports at the same time let them experiment with different sports and find what they really enjoy don't force them into one set path just keep the pressure as low as possible, really. Yeah, keep it fun. Yeah, basically. Who has been your biggest inspiration, either in sport or in life? Who has had the biggest impact? Uh, the person I've followed most in sport, as, as we say, going back, it's got to be Alistair, based on 
going to see him in Hyde Park in 2012 and then turning up to that PTO Hellbellen race and seeing him absolutely smash that and then also smashing Swansea. And yeah, he's, he's the person who, as an athlete, I've followed their career the most, I would say. I think he's, 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 very, he's very much a very good person as well. I think he's always friendly to people and stuff. He seems to send a really nice guy. Well, you're very nice to people yourself and a very nice guy. And uh, we're going to finish the podcast chat with that line and say thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I look forward to seeing you in Staffordshire. Very excited for you to toe the line. As you say now, yeah, yes. only yeah. two months away. The season's definitely yeah. getting going, isn't it? Yeah. Towing the line as a professional athlete for your first pro start. It's going to be very exciting. Yeah, nervous, but exciting, definitely. Yeah, we'll, well see. Well, I will see you there and the very best of luck. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can get in touch with any feedback or guest suggestions by emailing me on trytalkingsport at gmail.com. If you would like to hear more great episodes of the podcast, be sure to check them out on our website or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow all of our activities and podcasts on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and on Instagram. And as always, if you have any feedback or guest suggestions, please email me on trytalkingsport at gmail.com. I really would love to hear from you. Until next time, thanks as always for listening. Stay safe, keep smiling and remember to look for fun and adventure in every day.